Good evening, I'm John Carter, and welcome to Poland Daily. The Catholic Church has begun preparation for Easter with Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of the 40-day period of Lent. Priests visibly mark the faithful with ash on their heads while saying the words, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the Old Testament, when God spoke to his people, he led them out into the desert, and in the desert, as we know, there is no life. In the desert, man discovers his fragility, that he is dust and will return to dust. It is a good opportunity to experience spiritual renewal. Parishes organize numerous lectures, but the most important thing is how the gospel speaks to people today prayer, fasting, charity. I think we all pray too little. As a priest, I can say that you can do more, you can do better. Fasting is today considered an opportunity to shed a few pounds and get into shape. We all want to look beautiful, but the real purpose of fasting is to deny ourselves something we consider pleasant, to give charity to the poor. The fasting is done for good reason. It's an indicator of mercy towards others. That's why fasting and arms are alongside each other in the gospel of Christ. All this is to experience the joy of the resurrection of Christ, because he leads us to heaven and nothing can get dirty. It's a great time to make friends with Christ, purify your mistakes. What could be more important to us than to become fully human, to fulfill what God expects of us and be close to him? The tradition of Ash Wednesday, or Popielec in Polish, has been around since the 9th century. On this day, the heads of the faithful are sprinkled with ash, symbolizing penance, sorrow for sins, and a strong resolution to improve. This day is the beginning of the 40 days fast, a 40-day journey of work on myself. We like specific symbolism, and the fact that the priest is touching us at the moment with ash is a sign that it's the beginning. The bell is already ringing. From that moment, he your Lent begins. According to Father Stanisław Malkowski, it's a good time to overcome the evil spirit and hear what Christ has to say to us. Lent is a time of a certain self-discipline, of course, if someone takes this liturgical time seriously, but it's primarily a time of struggle with evil, and who should we imitate in this fight? Saints, and above all, the Lord Jesus and the Blessed Mother. In this message to the Holy See, the Holy Father spoke of following the footsteps of Christ. The great Lent of the Son of God was that he went out into the wilderness to bring creatures back into this garden of communion with God, who was before original sin. Let our Lent be a step into the same path. Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, commits believers between 18 and 60 to abstinence from meat foods. On this day, you are only to eat one meal until you are full, along with two other light meals. Krzysztof Kwiatkowski, the president of the Supreme Audit Office, otherwise known as NIK, which oversees the work of the most important Polish state institutions, stood before the Parliamentary VAT Tax Fraud Investigative Commission. In a recording released by the Tevupe Info website, Kwiatkowski held a discussion with the late Polish businessman Jan Kulczyk. Commenting on the low income of VAT tax to the state budget, Kwiatkowski was quoted as saying, the Ministry of Finance works like a babe in the woods. When asked to comment on this today, Kwiatkowski appeared very nervous. Krzysztof Kwiatkowski, former Minister of Justice, General Prosecutor and President of the Supreme Audit Office since 2013, using his allocated time to speak freely, talked about his achievements when he was still the Justice Minister. Other things, he mentioned that during his time of office, the e-court, e-protocol, e-mortgage registers and recording of court cases were implemented. Kwiatkowski also brought up Nick's reports on VAT tax, where abnormalities were pointed out. He also admitted that the fiscal system couldn't handle the scale of the VAT tax fraud. According to the members of the Commission, the abnormalities were in fact pointed out, but no actions were taken to reach their sources. We're the supreme audit institution. No audit institution in the world takes action, since we're just supposed to oversee. We have no executive power. I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off here. 
here, since you're not answering the question we asked. We know that you don't give specific instructions, but simply general recommendations. You gave such a recommendation in 2013, and I'm asking you now, did you give any further recommendations like that? Did you check if any action was in fact taken? We observe certain indicators if there was a change for the better in VAT tax income. We don't base our observations on specific solutions. Of course, we check if actions were taken, but we don't analyze them in detail. There was an improvement in VAT tax income, but we're not even able to tell how much of that improvement came from new legislative solutions and how much from the economic growth. Next president spoke very negatively about the possibility of retrieving the money lost in VAT tax fraud, but at the same time didn't consider our idea of extended confiscation, which would allow the state to take the money from criminals who already spent it. According to Krzysztof Kwiatkowski, the improvement in VAT tax income comes from the solutions presented by the Supreme Audit Office. Kwiatkowski claims that the ruling law and justice party is harvesting the fruits of the previous government. Kazimierz Smoliński, a member of the VAT Tax Fraud Investigative Commission, asked Nick's president about the recording released by the TVP.info news website, where Kwiatkowski speaks with the late Polish businessman Jan Kulczyk and says the words, the Ministry of Finance works like a babe in the woods. Kwiatkowski responded nervously and said that the person who recorded it is wanted by the police and that the commission is using evidence that was obtained illegally. Before Kwiatkowski's questioning, his predecessors and successors were questioned as well. Today, in the same, the Extraordinary Subcommittee met to investigate the fall of the debt collection company Get Back. The company's collapse led to hundreds of their clients suffering losses. Getback bondholders are trying to recover the money invested in the bonds, but not from Getback themselves. Instead, they are pursuing the banks that offered the bonds, including, among others, Idea Bank. Last week, the regional prosecutor's office in Warsaw filed charges against 18 managers and workers of Idea Bank in connection with Getback, the debt collection company scandal. Coincidentally, today in Parliament we witnessed the first session of the special subcommittee, which is to investigate that scandal. There were special visitors representing the victims who suffered the loss, and all they want is to recover the money they lost. I have in my hand the announcement by the Regional Prosecutor's Office in Warsaw from February 26, 2019. It communicates a clear message. The results of the investigation show that despite the fact that Idea Bank had no license to sell the get-back bonds, they were selling them under the guise of agreements to buy the bank's obligations. Who was holding a safety umbrella over this type of sham? We have 400 victims here. 400 at the moment. I am in close contact with the Central Anti-Corruption bureau agent assigned to our case who works with other agencies and we have new victims every day. People discover they have been scammed by reading the paper or articles online. They do not have the bank bonds, they have get back bonds. How is it possible that the Supreme Audit Office file a single case to the prosecutor's office against the Financial Supervision Authority? So that under the guise of the bank bonds, they sold get back bonds. Those are the investigation results. This is a huge scandal. This is why I am requesting to take up this priority matter, which is a bill against financial pyramid schemes. This in turn would provide the tools to go after financial schemes like this one, regardless of whether it was conducted in good faith or not. If someone came to me and said that they want to buy my old car, now worth 10,000 zlotys, for a sum of 100,000 zlotys, I would think about it. If someone said it was an extraordinary situation, then maybe I would sell my car. But if that person later returned stating that his money was from an unlawful activity, a kidnapping ransom, human trafficking or drug dealing, I would give back the difference to the real market value. Why is this not the case with the banks? If I bought a stolen car, the police would take it away from me. 
Here, in the case of banks, this is not done. Banks with signed contracts on overpriced financial instruments knew nothing would happen to them, so there must be a new law against such practices. The only way to stop that, to stop the creation of financial pyramids, which occur in Poland quite frequently, is not only to prosecute the crooks, it is to take away the money from the real benefactors of this kind of sham. Getback was not a classic financial pyramid, it was a debt collecting agency. The Getback Victims Association estimates that the loss of their clients amount to almost 2 billion zlotys. According to the most recent data from the Women in Work Index created by the services network PricewaterhouseCoopers, Poland is one of the top OECD countries in terms of the alleged issue of gender equality in the workplace. The Women in Work Index is a complex analysis of the situation of women in the workplace as well as their influence on the economies of the respective member states of the Organization for the Economic Cooperation and Development. It measures a plethora of indicators such as the gender pay gap, rate of unemployment among women, job security or the form of employment, full-time or otherwise. The 2019 edition of the Women in Work Index can be best summarized by its subtitle, Turning Policies into Effective Action to Advance Gender Equality. The seventh edition of the report measured and analyzed data from 2017. The data shows that the OECD has experienced a $6 trillion boost in its GDP from increasing female employment employment rates to match Sweden's rates. Meanwhile, OECD average gender pay gap has shrunk to 15%. According to the 2017 data, Iceland and Sweden are the top two countries with the best environment for women in the workplace. They are followed by New Zealand and Slovenia. Poland placed at the record-breaking eighth place. Poland, however, ranks second in the biggest progress made between the years 2000 and 2017, beaten only by Luxembourg. The NATO Supreme Commander General Curtis Scaparotti stated that the conflict in eastern Ukraine remains hot, with numerous ceasefire viola violations reported weekly. He referred to numerous shellings by Russian forces as well as the seizure of three Ukrainian Navy ships that have been kept by Russians in the illegally annexed Crimea for the past 100 days. Deputy Speaker of the Polish Parliament, Richard Terlecki, visited the front line in eastern Ukraine and posted this picture, which went viral in Poland. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening at Poland Daily. I'm John Carter. Stay tuned after the break for Poland Daily Weather. And that's followed by the business, then the culture, history and the travel. Welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tonight. Overcast skies can be observed in central and western Poland, but without any rainfall. Quite high temperatures are expected across the country. Szczecin will see a pleasant 9 degrees. The temperature in central Poland will hover around 5 degrees. The coldest part of Poland tonight will be the region of Podlasie with 3 degrees. We are expecting some overcast skies in the southeast and falling air pressure. And now over to tomorrow's forecast. Sunny weather in large parts of the country, but some rain is expected in the northwest. The temperatures will range from 11 degrees in Gdańsk to 16 in Katowice and there will be gusty winds across the country. Let's see the forecast for the following days. On Friday, light rain is expected across the country and the air pressure will remain low. Southeastern Poland will see the highest temperatures with up to 13 degrees. More light rain on Saturday, apart from the Baltic coast, which will experience heavy rainfall. And on Sunday, the temperatures will fall to 6 degrees in the northeast and 9 in southwestern Poland. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Poland Daily Business Edition. Tonight our guest is Matthew Thurman, right from New York, our own American political analyst. We used to have divide in Europe. Basically, on the left from River Waba, we had industrial 
countries that were very active in the sea trade. On the right side of the Waba, we had agricultural countries providing food and agricultural products. Now, the same divide concerns Muslims. On the left from, on the west, we had uh, countries with diverse population rich in Muslims. On the right side, we have minimal amount of Muslim population. How does this happen? How do you think? Well, uh, I think that you see ground zero for the divide is in the post-Iron Curtain nations who had to deal with a unelected, uh, tyrannical, oppressive bureaucracy for, for uh, two generations, for, for several, se many decades, 40, 50 years. And they were told that their culture is going to be subordinated to the Soviet culture. Uh, of the 20th and 21st century progressive utopia. Uh, and they rejected that, thankfully. Uh, and these are peoples that have had uh, frequently tough history, Poland being the, the greatest example, where there was imperialism all around, whether it was Austro-Hungarian, uh, German, Prussian, Russian, Tsarist, and then Soviet. Uh, and they do care about the cultural values. And if not homogeneity by, by fiat, knowing that their societies, their cultures were built by their people for many, many centuries, millennia, uh, there's a value system there, as opposed to the quote unquote elite progressive enlightened West, where the historical cultures were broken down uh, by a elite, and especially in academia, uh, and now you see the cultural degradation that happens with cultural relativism. They're one of the uh, major uh, isms of this uh, leftist cohort. Uh, they don't care about the French Academy does not care about French culture. Germany as well. They believe, and this is in the American left as well, they believe that they need to make apologies for the history and they romanticize the exotic. In this case, uh, the Islamification of Europe that they've embraced uh, started off as something that they found to be very romantic, very, uh, you know, uh, the West is not the best, so let's bring in those who are not Western, even those who are at odds and hostile to the values that have created a successful, the most successful civilization in world history, the Western civilization, both in Europe and America. Uh, so this Islamification of Europe that's happened uh, from Germany uh, westward, uh, as opposed to those who came out of 1989 looking to just regain their sovereignty, not just national, but cultural, uh, is very much at odds. Uh, I've made no secret where I stand on this issue, and I think that the peoples, uh, the electorates, and this is not just in the, in the East and Central European uh, plain, Poles and Romanians and uh, even Austrians now with the Three Seas Initiative looking, uh, looking eastward, not westward, uh, they do care about their societies. It's the, the technocratic elite that rise to the quote-unquote top frequently through a coercive mechanisms that are uh, defending uh, the status quo that they've injected into their societies against the will of the people. You see that when it gets rejected, they do things like hold referendums over and over again till they get the answer they want. The technocratic elite know how to utilize the technocratic power structures to benefit their worldview. Uh, Poland has been on the, uh, the sort of uh, bad end of this, uh, has been a victim of this because of the double standards that we see. There was never any complaints from the European Union about corruption or media or rule of law or bad behavior or even uh, stolen elections like Gdansk in uh, 2014. EU was nowhere on this because the, they were working with a incumbent political structure on the ground, Platform Obatelska, that was willing to cede Polish sovereignty to Brussels to the European project. Uh, that has obviously inflected, inflected in Hungary and Poland uh, first and foremost uh, in, the, uh, in the early 20, 2010 teens uh, and then obviously with Brexit. And the EU is absolutely uh, apoplectic that they're losing their project. Uh, you've got commentators like Ann Applebaum, who've worked for decades to try and drive her countries, and it's Poland, the US, and the UK, to the global left, to supranational governance structures where she maintained the levers of technocratic power, where she had outsized impact. Well, she's lost uh, all three of those battles on all three of those grounds uh, of, of political battle, and they're apoplectic. So they spread lies about rule of law and fascism and you know, 250,000 Polish marchers, not a single car rearview mi window uh, mirror broken, uh, now no fights, no arrests, no windows, nothing. And uh, uh, the elite left is tweeting, you know, 250,000 fascists to send on Warsaw. Well, that's at odds with reality, and thankfully we are winning the debate, and this is proof because we are winning, and all they can do is call us Nazis or fascists or some other ridiculous ad hominem attack that is 
definitely not even remotely grounded in reality. Right. But Without the European Union, this part of Europe would not be as well off as it is, at least so they say. Yeah, and there's some truth to that. You know, Ascension in 2004 helped Poland because it opened up a new market for Polish, uh, Polish uh, players uh, to take Polish human capital and move it around the continent. And that meant, you know, learning, transfer, as well as teaching, uh, selling, and buying. Uh, so these were very, very uh, helpful dynamics uh, in the early 2000s. But everything is a trend. Nothing is static. And the trend became toward too much political coordination, not enough economic freedom, which was what was sold in the first place. It was an economic uh, free trade zone uh, that people could move across to engage in free trade. Uh, and then it became all about political harmonization and coordination. Uh, you know, what they say, European values. So, you know, those European values only seem to apply uh, as a, uh, a, a stick to beat those countries that don't adhere to the right politics, not the right values. Because look at France, they're burning cars every day. Uh, where's rule of law under attack there? Or, uh, or Germany, where they refuse to cover actual news events if it uh, offends a politically correct sensibility. Uh, that, to me, is rule of law under attack. That, to me, is uh, amoral. Uh, but those are European values uh, being heeded if they have the right political inclinations to focus on European Union agglomeration of sovereignty as opposed to fighting for your own nation state. Matthew Thurman, thank you very much for participating in our show. And that was it. Welcome back to Poll One Daily Weather. And now over to tomorrow's forecast. Sunny weather in large parts of the country, but some rain is expected in the northwest. The temperatures will range from 11 degrees in Gdańsk to 16 in Katowice, and there will be gusty winds across the country. Let's take a look at tomorrow's forecast for our continent. The temperatures on the Balkans will hover around 18 degrees. Lower temperatures on the Iberian Peninsula with 13 degrees in Madrid and in Lisbon. Still high temperatures in Rome with up to 20 degrees. Thunderstorms over the British Isles and some snowfall in Scandinavia. 8 degrees in Helsinki, but only 2 in Oslo. Thank you for watching. Good night. The Polish People's Republic was a state in Central Europe that existed from 1947 to 1989 and the predecessor of the modern Democratic Republic of Poland. With a population of approximately 37.9 million inhabitants near the end of its existence, it was the most populous state of the Eastern Bloc after the Soviet Union. Having a unitary Marxist-Leninist-Communist government, it was also one of the main signatories of the Warsaw Pact. The People's Republic of Poland represented an era of many paradoxes. On the one hand, the reconstruction of the country from war damage was accompanied by enormous social enthusiasm. On the other, it was impossible to escape the intensified party propaganda of success, and the scale of persecution by the security service was unprecedented. The average inhabitant of the People's Republic suffered the consequences and limitations resulting from the inefficiency of nationalized industry. However, it was also a time of great creativity and resourcefulness. In today's episode, I'm with Artur Gurniewski at the Museum of PRL in Warsaw, and we will be discussing the history of the communist times in Poland. Hello, Artur, and welcome again to Poland Daily Culture. Hi, Paula. It's a pleasure of mine to be invited again. It will be a pleasure of mine to answer your questions, to, uh, to tell you about this period of time in our history. Was the minimum wage a thousand zlotys? So how did it look? Did everyone get the same amount of money for the work they did? Mostly people were given um, a very similar amount of money, unless... So it was equal, more or less? So the philosophy was supposed to bring equality to society. We must remember that Polish currency was worth very little at that period of time. So if you wanted to buy something using US dollars, for instance, they were amazingly expensive. Mm -hmm. So you had to deal with it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are so many different ways that people were dealing with that period of time mm -hmm. that um, I think this is, that was this um, capitalist 
issue of communist Poland that somehow you just had to deal with it. Some, somehow you had to organize it. Somehow you had to find the new currency. And well. it changed in 1995, I believe, the money in Poland. Because it used to be, uh, now we have 50 zlotys and before it was 5,000 Yes, zlotis. yes, uh, we cut uh, four zeros uh, from our, so one million became 100. This is also interesting because how much money were people carrying those days? Oh, of course, when it comes to the um, um, number of uh, the strength of your currency is not represented by the number of zeros, but uh, how um, its um, value changes according to economical stuff that happens all over the world. So, of course, within the time in this capitalist world, Polish currency, well, we are still dependent on euro currency when it comes to the ricochets that happen on entire planet Earth. Uh, but, of course, there is a lot of things to catch up when it comes to uh, our economy. But our culture, that's amazing, uh, could um, adopt to such a different moments in our history uh, and somehow survive. We were really like a duck, you know? When you see a duck on a lake above the surface of water, the duck seems to be calm. The duck seems to be just looking around what's happening. And that was Polish nation at the time, under the surface of water. Legs of the duck are running like this, like crazy. Oh, and this is what Polish and this is what Polish people were doing in this time, taking care of their real culture uh, not to die. And, uh, and they managed. Our forefathers did it. Uh, and uh, we are the best example right now. Knowing uh, Polish novels, knowing Polish uh, most important history figures, the fact that we have a Polish passport and we are proud of it means that our forefathers really made it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. In this episode, we will explore the most interesting exhibits that are in the museum, Life Under Communism. The shortage of most common products could make everyday life a nightmare for Poles during the People's Republic. During many of the frequent economic crises, store shelves would literally be empty. The museum Life Under Communism was founded by Rafał and Marta Patla. Their first idea was to collect a few items and family memorabilia to create a flat from the communist times in the garage in Soho factory. The average inhabitant of the People's Republic suffered the consequences and limitations resulting from the inefficiency of nationalized industry. However, it was also a time of increased creativity and resourcefulness. Although the quality of the gastronomy, including subsidized milk bars, left much to be desired, social, artistic, and literary life thrived in cafes. Supply shortages left stores empty, but queues would line up anyway. What is at your fingertips today was inaccessible to an ordinary citizen of the People's Republic of Poland. The aim of the exhibition is to show everyday life in the Polish People's Republic. The interiors and objects presented at the exhibition tell the story of how the policy of people's rule influenced the daily lives of citizens. Okay then, so we've got some uh, artifacts on this wall. It looks like some hair dryers. Yes, yes, hair dryers. Uh, this was uh, well, good Polish design, I uh -huh. would say. As you see, the variety of uh, uh, hair dryers, uh, different times, mainly 70s, 80s, uh, but uh, today it looks like a cosmic design, you know, like from the uh, 21st century. It does a bit. I'm interested in this one. I, I can't really quite comprehend how this works. Ah, it's it's for curling hair? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not good in that subject, so let's continue. <laughs> uh, so we have a famous uh, Zephyr uh, fan, Farrell, that was the, the same company like producing hair dryers, but this was this uh, warmer, uh, warming machine, uh, Farrell, that's uh, one of the most popular one, and uh, I would say symbolic one. Well, we have some uh, advertisements. That was uh, advertisement of uh, Polish, uh, Polish products. Uh, so, but they seem to be written in, in Russian. 
Yeah, yeah, because it was sent, it was exported to Soviet Union. Yeah? So, uh -huh. so uh, in Russian magazine, uh, you could see that. No? Uh, also, uh, well, vacuum cleaners, this is always funny to, to talk about vacuum cleaners because uh, I, I will ask you, which one is the oldest in your opinion? Ooh. Well, because it feels like you're trying ah. to catch me out, I'm going to go with this one because it looks the most futuristic. Okay, okay, exactly. <laughs> so everyone think this is the oldest one. That would be my first thought, honestly. And that was the newest one. So by the, this is the oldest one. So by the vacuum cleaners, we wanted to show what happened with the economy. So the, with the economy, it happened this. Every decade, the quality went down. Got worse. It's opposite okay. to the capitalist economy. No? Uh -huh. So uh, 50s, um, like the, the vacuum cleaner that I showed before, in the 50s, the design, the quality of work was still uh, competitive with the West. But then, and then every decade, worse and worse, uh, up to this scale. But we have a very interesting machine, I think unique today, which is uh, this. What do you think? What is that for? Right, well, uh, I would go with some sort of clothing repair machine, uh, but yeah, you want yeah, to tell yeah, close, me the close. details? Close, it's a, a machine to repair stockings. Uh -huh. uh, if you would never see that such a machine in the West because you could just throw out and buy new stockings. But in the situation where you couldn't buy new stockings, you had to repair it. So there were special uh, places called, uh, like in Polish, it's called Maszyna do Repasacji Pończoch. Sounds quite weird. But uh, there were special uh, points where you could give your stockings and the ladies would repair it. So, uh, so that was very important machine in these times, especially for ladies. Right, certainly. All right, Raphael, thanks very much. You're for welcome. Giving us a little tour around the museum. Yeah, a little. <laughs> <laughs>
After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo and the 1815 Congress of Vienna, Russia took control over Warsaw again. However, one of the provisions of the Congress of Vienna stipulated that the semi-autonomous status of the Duchy of Warsaw would remain in the new Russian satellite state known as the Congress Kingdom. The Polish Congress Kingdom was allowed to have its own constitution, one of the most liberal in Europe of the time. But a couple of years after the Vienna Congress, the Russian Tsar started ignoring the constitution. As a consequence, the Poles decided to revolt against the Russian Empire in 1830, an event which became known as the November Uprising. The November Uprising is known to have connection to the reformist movement in the Russian Empire. And I was hoping you can elaborate about the connections between the two. Powstanie listopadowe jest rzeczywiście efektem głębokich przemian, jakie rozegrały się w państwie carów. The November uprising was indeed partly a result of deep changes that took place in the Tsarist state. It should be called so, since the state included not only Russia, but also the so-called autonomous areas, meaning Finland, the Kingdom of Georgia and the Kingdom of Poland, which was also called Congress Kingdom because it was established after the Congress of Vienna. And dissidents from these three countries started to work together in order to create a wider movement of resistance. The most important thing is that after the fall of Napoleon, the young, educated Russian military officers themselves spent over three years in France occupying its northern regions. And there, they learned French culture, the culture of everyday life and the culture of ordinary people living there. They learned French dances, which are no longer remembered by the French people, but have been preserved to this day in the area of the Russian Ural Mountains. Such dances are still danced there, remembered there, for instance, a dance called quadrille, and first of all, they adopted the idea of reforming the state towards a system of parliamentary monarchy. They wanted a constitution and a rule of law, and at that point, a deep cooperation was established between the so-called Polish Patriotic Society, which was established in the territory of the land which used to be a part of Poland, with the Decemberists, the movement of Russian progressive aristocrats who wanted to reform the state. There is a suspicion that Tsar Alexander the first himself supported the movement to a certain degree. We know for sure that he was aware that such an association existed. The movement was intertwined with that of the Freemasons at the beginning, although it was a patriotic form of Freemasonry. After the mysterious death of Tsar Alexander I in 1825, the Decemberist revolt broke out in St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, the uprising fell and its leaders were sentenced to death. They were killed under mysterious circumstances and buried in a place that hasn't been found until today. The Polish soldiers who decided to launch the November Uprising modeled their movement to a certain degree to that of the Decemberists. Why is it so important? It can be answered by slogans that were used by the Poles during the November Uprising, one of the most beautiful slogans in Europe, in my opinion. It went, for our freedom and yours, and has become one of the unofficial mottos of Poland. It meant that the Poles didn't fight against the Russian nation, but that they fought against the Tsarist autocracy which oppressed Russians and Poles alike. It was supposed to signal that there is a common enemy. They even created banners with embroidered inscriptions in both Polish and Russian, saying, we fight for our Svoboda or freedom and yours. Svoboda, meaning freedom, is an old Slavic word which the Russians understand. Us Poles usually use the word wolność or liberty. Wolność is an even older Slavic word, but the Russians don't use it since centuries, but us Poles do. Svoboda also has a greater meaning than just personal freedom. It can imply political and social freedom too. Poles wanted to continue the work of the Decemberists. At the most important moment after the outbreak of the November Uprising, a huge funeral ceremony for the Decemberist leaders was organized in Warsaw. Of course, the bodies of the Decemberist leaders hadn't been found, but some soil from St. Petersburg was brought to Poland by representatives of the Polish parliament who had traveled there in in order to negotiate with Tsar Nicholas I. 
He, as we must remember, was both the Tsar of Russia and the King of Poland. They brought some soil from the place where Russian Decembrist heroes had been killed and urns with this soil were put in the coffins. The urns had inscriptions with the names, surnames and army ranks of the Decembrist leaders. The five most important Decembrist leaders, including Kondraty Rileyev, Sergei Muravyov Apostol and Mikhail Bestuzhev, were given an honorary funeral in Warsaw. This was supposed to show the Polish Brotherhood with the Russians against the despotic Tsarist Empire. Apostol Muravyov, Bestuzhev and inni. I urządzono im pogrzeb w Warszawie. To miało świadczyć o braterstwie z Rosjanami przeciwko Caratowi jako despoto. The Russian Tsar and his court reacted with fury to the news of the November uprising. Next up, we will ask Dr. Shishov Yabłonka whether the liberal faction of Russian society who remained attached to the cause of the Decabrist revolt saw matters differently. So how did the insurgents of the Decapitalist movement react to the uprising that took place in Warsaw? Rosyjska opinia publiczna, ta bardziej liberalna i czekająca na reformy. The liberal public opinion in Russia, which was awaiting reforms, found the event very fortunate and accepted it with joy. They thought that Tsar Nicholas, who had ruled Russia for five years by that point in time, would change his attitude towards the Poles and give them complete constitutional rights. The case is that Russia broke constitutional rights and had no constitution implemented in their own country. The Tsar just couldn't adjust to a constitutional system where he was told what he can and cannot do. If he were to succumb to the pressure and accept the constitution which was accepted in the Polish kingdom, it would be easier to adapt this constitution in Russia later on and implement a constitutional rule which would make Russia one of the civilized European countries. By that point, after the surge of Napoleon, almost all of them had adopted some sort of constitution, whether it was well constructed or not. They lived by some state-governed rules. Meanwhile, Russia was an absolute monarchy, which in part resulted from their tradition, inherited from the Byzantine Empire, and so the Tsar completely rejected it. There is a beautiful proverb which was first recorded in that time in the Russian society and was later retold in the time between the uprisings by a Russian writer, Alexander Herzen, which says, We are pro-Poland because we are pro-Russia, meaning those who really love Russia support Poland and that Poles are not fighting Russians, but the Tsarist rule, who incidentally preferred the German nationals as the ruling dynasty originated from the region of Holstein. They were not Russians. And so it was believed that the Slavic nations will find a common language and work certain issues out, provided they get rid of this German armor which constricted them. The Tsarist regime did an incredible amount of damage in the field of propaganda. They managed to convince their citizens, who at the time were not particularly particularly literate, that Poles are the age-old enemies of the Orthodox Church, the Tsarist autocracy, and everything that is Russian. And that process of turning Russians against Poles continues until this day, because Poland is sort of an understandable alternative to Russians. Poland is a part of Western Europe, but with a Slavic core. Many words and expressions permeate from the Russian language to ours, and vice versa. Those pro-liberal Russians who wanted to lead a peaceful life free of any form form of authoritarianism always referred to Poland as this alternative version of how their history could have looked like. This point of view, this way of looking at Poland by Russians, has its roots in these exact times. On the other hand, Poles coined a new motto for our and your freedom. This was to become the most important slogan of the upcoming Spring of Nations, when thousands of Poles fought for the freedom of Hungary, when Hungarians fought in the Polish uprising, when we all fought for France, and finally when each of those nations found themselves at the side of Garibaldi as he was leading the charge to unify Italy. Therefore, Poles played an enormous role with their uprising. When it comes to the 1825 December is uprising, there was a chance that this uprising would be a success. The Senate was in session, therefore it could make the decision to dethrone Tsar Nicholas and replace him with his older brother, Constantine. However, Constantine denounced his right to the throne as he married a Polish woman. That was a mysterious decision. Meanwhile, the military was so oblivious that they would respond to the call of their offices by exclaiming, long live Tsar Constantine and his wife, the Constitution. 
constitution, as those were the two things the society wanted. That was the first understanding of the constitution in Russia, the Tsar's wife. That is what happens when political and patriotic awareness overshadows social awareness. Tak to wygląda jak e, świadomość e, e, polityczna i patriotyczna no, przewyższa świadomość społeczną. As we can observe, the memories of the historical battles are still kept alive and well, even centuries after the battles have taken place. Clearly, the struggle for national sovereignty is still a key value within the Polish collective memory. That's it for today. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. Hello and welcome back to Poland Daily Travel. We're glad you tuned in. Well, we're glad you're watching us on YouTube. Lots of stuff to see. Your best source for travel information about Poland. We'll be venturing forth soon to exciting sites around Poland and nearby. But today we're in Warsaw and we're focusing on the Warsaw Old Town. We start at St. Anna's Church and talk about its significance and how Poland saved Europe twice. That's right, count it, twice. We'll be looking at some of the secrets of the old town, some of the stories and vignettes, and uh, just two guys going for a walk on a sunny day. So stay with us on Poland Daily Travel. We're really glad you tuned in, because why do we do this? We do it for you. Stay with us. Okay, we're back with Poland Daily Travel. We're in the Military Memorial Chapel in St. Anna's Church uh, on the edge of the Old Town in Warsaw. And now we want to talk to uh, you a little bit about uh, some of the most important military leaders. Uh, we already discussed some of the, the great battles. Uh, Arthur, why don't you take us through your your picks, and maybe I'll jump in if I know something about it. Yeah? Yes, yes, we've got three hours and a half, so to just briefly <laughs> describe you the yeah, history of Polish one. generals. Yeah, yeah. Well, starting from the top of this of this plaque, uh, we are having uh, Stanisław Żółkiewski and Jan Karol Chodkiewicz. These are late 1500s, early 1600s generals. And Stanisław Żółkiewski, that's an amazing story about this guy. He got wounded during the battle against Austrians uh, in 1588 when Habsburgs wanted to take Polish throne. Uh, we took the Swedish guy, we took the King Sigismund, and this is when Austrians attacked us. So we, uh, so we defended ourselves and we managed to do it. And then we are having wars against Sweden that we mentioned, Kirchholm. We are having Kushin against Russia. And this is a moment when we supply Austrian troops against uh, the area of Siedmiogród, uh, which was paying money to Ottoman Empire. And that's why Ottomans got angry at us and they attacked us. And it happened in 1620, the Battle of Cezora. We have an amazing pen painting presenting Stanisław Żółkiewski in his 70s. He's 73 years old when he's holding a sword in his hand and he's fighting with Ottomans and he gets wounded and he dies right after this battle. And, and then one year later, Jan Karol Chodkiewicz dies. So he in was the fighting the Battle of Vienna? Uh, he was fighting the Battle of Cezora 1620. So, oh, or, or, yes, okay. so, I, but also uh, against the Ottomans. Yeah. Uh, so 63 years before Vienna. Right. So wait a second, you are correct. You pointed out that Poland was attacked by Ottomans twice. First Cezora 1620 and then 1621 first battle at Chocim. Mm -hmm. that was won by Polish troops and it's thanks to Jan Karol Chodkiewicz who died during this battle, so a year after a year most important Polish generals okay. died. So these two guys were both times fighting the Ottomans and both of them died uh, fighting them. Exactly. Yeah. Who's next? Um, out of so many important surnames, let me point out Tadeusz Kościuszko and uh, Mr. Pułaski. So mm -hmm. if you are from the US... Kazimierz. 
you know that Kazimierz Pułaski... These are very famous people in, uh, in American history. How about a uh, Saratoga uh, battle where mm -hmm. uh, Tadeusz Kościuszko designed the fortifications? He was famous for designing fortifications. Um, uh, how about um, uh, West Point? Uh, for example. And then Pulaski, of course, was in charge of the American Revolutionary Army in the South. Uh, in fact, one of my ancestors fought with Pulaski in the Battle of Savannah. Uh, so I've, I've heard a lot about him in my life, but Pulaski is a, a, a huge hero as well. He once saved George Washington's life, did he not? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, and that's why yeah. uh, both of them were ordered uh, by George Washington in 1777. Uh, order of Cincinnati was given to Tadeusz Kościuszko personally by George Washington, and just steps away from the White House, you are having a sculpture of Tadeusz Kościuszko. And one, on 100th anniversary of putting that sculpture in Washington, D.C., the copy of that sculpture was put in Warsaw right behind the Saxon Garden. Yeah, it's an amazing story. Uh, in a previous episode, we actually saw that, uh, saw that statue and talked about Mr. Uh, and General Kosciuszko. How do you say it? Kosciuszko. So Kosciuszko. The, uh, yes, okay. when you take a look at the map, you yeah. see Australia and you point the highest mountain in Australia called Kosciuszko Mountain. There you are. Who's next? So let's talk about Joseph Bem, amazing guy. He was born right before Poland lost the independence, and then all he was doing in his life was trying to get Poland back on the maps. The last words that he said in his life was, Poland, it will be not me who will save you. He was fighting in Portugal, he was fighting against the, the Russians, he was he is a hero of Hungary. Uh, the only uh, diamond taken from St. Stephen's crown was put on an order of Joseph Bem, thanks to whom, at, start, at some point, we, call, we don't call it Austrian Empire, but Austro-Hungarian Empire, because of the 1848 revolution that took place in Budapest that he was leading. Russians had to bring 100,000 troops so to stop that revolution. Previously, Joseph Bem was a leader of revolution in Vienna. He also took people to fight how against... Do, how do you say his name? Joseph... Bem. Bem. B Joseph B -E -M? Bem. B-E-M? B-E-M. Yeah, Bem. Okay. Um, so he's, a, he's another great hero. Not a lot of people uh, probably know about him. Just, much, but a, yes. a great hero of the Hungarian uh, uh, fighting with Hungary. After yeah. all of this, Joseph mm -hmm. Bem escapes to Ottoman Empire, right. and he becomes a field marshal of Ottoman Empire. He transforms into Muslim religion, so on his grave it's written Murat Pasha, and uh, he protected the city of Aleppo from Bedouins, and then he died because of the disease that spread out over there. So was he it was a plague or something? He was, it was a plague, exactly, no. Asian malaria. Asian malaria. And uh, uh, this was, so he converted, here's a, a, a Polish guy, who, a Polish Catholic who converts to Muslim religion after having fought did he fight the Ottomans as well, or never? Uh, uh, he wasn't the one who was fighting the Ottomans never right. in his life, yeah. but he did it so to have a new and normal life in Ottoman Empire, and then he established right. a factory uh, producing gunpowder with a cost of 30% lower than the regular one, and that's why Sultan of Ottoman Empire gave him the possibility to be the, to be the field marshal of Ottoman Empire, which is the most important job, and yeah. you are more important than a Sultan when the country is in war, and the country was in war against the Bedouins, so Joseph Bem was given the highest possible orders for, for bravery by the French, Napoleon right. invasion yeah. on Russia, sure. uh, by the Poles, by the Hungarians, and mm -hmm. by Ottoman Empire. So that's a man who was, uh, who discovered, who invented the rocket artillery. He was writing books about engines, and he was, um, he also was running uh, a saloon in Paris, so he was like really the man of his days, and he was doing everything for Poland, but Poland was not on the maps yet. Wow. And what about, uh, who's next? On, uh, How about General Anders? Well, yes, General Anders, who, who led the Poles from, uh, led his Polish army from, uh, from Siberia to Iran to North Africa, 
all the way to Monte Cassino. Exactly. Yeah. So Legendary man. First, yeah. after Poland was attacked by German troops, we created Polish underground army AK, and then Polish army was reborn in France. Then France was conquered by Germany, so Polish army was re reborn in England, and then also in deep Siberia, thanks to General Anders, who takes them through all Asia up to Monte Cassino, and he is the one who conquers Monte Cassino, and just uh, in recent years, there is a graveyard of Polish soldiers opened in Monte Cassino. First, soldiers who stayed in territory of Israel, of Palestine over there, were soldiers of General Anders, who decided to stay in Jerusalem after they reached it, after so many years. So it's an amazing story of an amazing man, and he's so important to so many nations and countries. Um, I, met General his, I met his daughter. I met his daughter. She uh, is doing some, uh, a lot of uh, publicity on behalf of Poland, and uh, she has a, 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 some kind of ambassadorial role, I can't remember the name, for the Polish government. No, very nice woman. And very uh, important for current Polish politics yeah. and also history life. Yeah. And who do we have last? How about Bur Komorowski? Yeah. So the leader of Polish army um, during World War II. So Polish army that was fighting Germans. You mean the and secret army. Yeah. The, so the, that's the, why there the is a nickname. Army, that's called. why there okay. is the nickname. Right. You didn't call people by their name during World War II in here. Everyone had a nickname. So, for instance, imagine. Or a nom de guerre, we can say. Exactly. A war name. Yeah. A war name. That's mm -hmm. how it was exactly. Mm -hmm. So till the, till the last day of the war, Germans didn't find out who was the leader of Polish army, but Polish army found out who was the leader of German army in Warsaw, even though he didn't provide his name, yeah. Franz Kuchera, and Polish troops killed him. There was just an anniversary on yeah. 1st of February 1944. That's Polish incredible. general yeah. of German army in Warsaw is killed by Polish underground army. Big retaliations, 500 people people taken out from their flats in Warsaw yeah. and killed in front of them in the district of Wawer. Yeah. So Polish history is a, is a series of uh, very important military engagements, not just to Poland, but because of its uh, position uh, within Europe. Uh, it involves, has always involved many other countries, Russia, Austria, and the Austrian Empire, uh, uh, the Prussians, the Germans later, and uh, even even Napoleon was here, but he rather made made friends with 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 the Polish. Anyway, um, we're here in the military uh, memorial room. It's a uh, a place of uh, deep uh, historical resonance for for Poles of all all kinds. And uh, I want to thank you for staying with us. Thanks, Arthur, for that amazing rundown. Uh, we could we could be here hours talking about these amazing. Uh, uh, people, each one of them has had many books written about them. Um, but we gave you a little shorthand uh, as to their importance, uh, just choosing a few of them. Stay with us. Poland Daily Travel. We're going to go for a walk. Stay with us. <laughs>